I want to welcome everyone this morning on our first Sunday in July. And as I'm sure all of you know by now, that next Sunday, um, July 12th, will be when we reopen um, Asbury here, and we're going to worship in the sanctuary. It'll be our first uh, time back since uh, we've been away uh, because of the virus. And our opening plan has been sent out. Uh, we sent it out to you in, uh, in an email. We had it out also in our uh, circuit rider, our newsletter, and I hope you've had an, a chance to take a look at it so you know what to expect um, if you do choose to come. It's important that you know that. And things like, you know, we're going to be required to wear a mask. There will be um, no singing um, from the congregation, um, social distancing, no fellowship, and those kind of things. But we just think it's important that um, everyone is aware of uh, what to expect. It's going to be a little different. Well, probably actually a lot different, but if you have any questions, uh, concerns, or anything you want to talk about, uh, email the office, call the office, give me a call, and we'll talk uh, and, you know, fill you in on everything that we do know. And if you look behind me, I don't know, you may be able to see, you may not. We've already started kind of marking off our pews uh, for social distancing, but I ask that everyone just be patient with us because this is a learning experience. You know, this is something like we've never done before, and uh, we're going to learn as we go, and we're going to make mistakes along the way, and we're just going to get better. But um, as we do this, as you come for worship and we figure things out, I'm just really asking for your love, your grace, and of course, uh, your patience. And as I've said many times uh, before and with every correspondence that has been out, um, I want no one to feel um, pressured or feel like they have to come or feel like they're missing something if they don't come because our number one goal here um, is safety, um, health of all of us that worship here, so that decision has to be made um, personally with uh, you and your family. And if you choose not to come, um, totally understandable. We just ask and hope that you continue to worship with us. Because what we're going to do is we're going to record our Sunday service um, that we hold here in the sanctuary. And then later Sunday afternoon, we will put that up online. And then you can worship at that time, uh, you know, once it's out. And we'll send an email once it is online so you'll know exactly when to tune into that service. Um, but, uh, you know, just know that you can still worship with us uh, no matter continuing at your home um, or here in the sanctuary as we get back uh, together again in that way. Since we are in a new month, I want to remind you about our mission focus, also our communion offering for July. But our mission focus all month long um, is the Ark of Salem County. And for our communion offering in July, it is the Disciples' Pantry. So, as always, during these times, I ask that we be good witnesses that we share our faith, uh, we share our hope, and of course that we share our worship services. And if you would, please bow with me uh, in an opening word of prayer. Gracious God, thank you for this day and this time that we can come to worship you. And as always, Lord, we know wherever we are, you are with us. Uh, we thank you for that and allow us um, in our places to worship you um, and to look to you, Lord, and to give thanks. We just ask for a blessing upon this time that we are together, and we just ask that you allow us to continually recognize your presence and your spirit that we know is always with us. And we ask this in all Jesus' precious name. Amen. And it is my pleasure, as always, to uh, turn it over for our opening song to our very own Ron Batdorf. And he always does pick a special song, as you know by now. And for this week, on the 4th of July weekend, Ron's picked a special song, and it's called America the beautiful. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ron.
Thank you, Ron, for opening up our service uh, with that beautiful song uh, about America. And I uh, want to start today with a question, if you will, or maybe even just a thought or for something for you to consider. But when you hear the word freedom or to be free, you know, what comes to your mind or, you know, how would you define that? And since uh, we celebrated the 4th of July on Saturday, or actually just yesterday, um, I felt that maybe that was an interesting uh, way to start the conversation uh, about the message I wanted to speak about today in Romans from the Apostle Paul. You know, um, on the 4th of July, we think of it as a day marking uh, America's independence, or, you know, the birth of the U.S. as an independent uh, nation. And, you know, sometimes they think, well, independent of what? And, you know, history tells us, and if you, you know, look back that, you know, in July of 1776, you know, during the second year of the American Revolutionary War, um, representatives from the 13 Northern American colonies of the United Kingdom, or the Kingdom of Great Britain, they voted to declare themselves independent, independent from the crown. And by doing so, forming the United States of America. And some may think of independence um, as freedom. And that's why I kind of try to make that connection with 4th of July of thinking it's independent or independent nation. And sometimes we think of independence as freedom. I mean, there are plenty of ways that we individually will define freedom, I'm sure. And you're probably thinking of many right now um, that I haven't highlighted or probably won't highlight. So... But as a baseline for freedom, uh, I wanted to give you a definition. So I went to my favorite source. Yes, you'd say Google, but I have another favorite source online for defining things, and that's none other than dictionary.com. So I went to dictionary.com, I looked up um, freedom, and uh, the top uh, definitions for freedom were exempt from external control, um, exempt from interference, um, exempt from regulation, and then a, a couple definitions down said it was a power to determine action um, without restraint. Um, so that whole sense of maybe being free. And, you know, some may think um, of freedom in the sense of the free spirit that wanders around or wanders the world. Um, free bird from Leonard Skinner or free falling from Tom Petty or rocking the free world from Neil Young. And I just took you down a trip of memory lane of my late 60s, early 70s uh, rock and roll favorites. But, uh, you know, another way to think about freedom. How about uh, New Hampshire's license plate? Uh, do you know what the state motto is on the license plate? I'm sure you've probably seen it or have taken note of it at some point or, not, on an, or another. But the motto on their plate says, live free or die. And it's an interesting story how that whole kind of phrase came out. Um, from a revolutionary general by the name of John Stark. Apparently, he was giving a toast but couldn't make it to this event, and it was written in, on a letter, so some form of this live, free, or die um, was on this letter. You ought to look it up one day if you're interested in that kind of stuff. It's an interesting story. Um, so, yeah, so then live, free, or die became this um, slogan or motto for New Hampshire. Well, um, that was challenged legally um, by a Jehovah Witness, actually, um, this person actually covered up the or die part on their license plate. And um, the state said, no, you can't do that. That's part of, uh, you know, uh, the, our, the license plate, which is a legal um, thing on your vehicle and, you know, all these kind of things. So a fight, a legal battle ensued. Um, and he cited religious reasons for covering up the or die because, you know, in Christ you don't die. And, uh, you know, so the court ruled um, in favor and now, in New Hampshire, you are free, if you will, to cover up part or all of that motto on the license plate. Okay. So I highlighted these cases or just some of these things to say this. That our own personal experiences, um, our upbringing, you know, uh, ethnic, cultural, social backgrounds, um, our faith, for that matter, as we've seen in this New Hampshire incident, they would all and they will all shape the way we answer that question or the thought of what it means to be free. You know, when I think of in the United States, um, you know, we're, we're protected by freedoms and with the First Amendment, you know, we have the freedom of religion, the freedom of speech, you know, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly. Others may see this whole side of freedom 
um, from the perspective of slavery and their ancestors fighting to be a free people, people that were held down through slavery, no freedom seen and fought for that freedom. Or I think of child slavery and to some of these working conditions in these places they, you know, make these children work. Um, you know, uh, just human trafficking as a sense of slavery. Um, others, maybe from the life behind bars, um, you know, there's no freedom as they are locked away. And still others, maybe they look for freedom of addiction. And, you know, I believe all of us have some sense or a desire to be free from something. And I'm not trying to say that in some philosophical, you know, kind of way, um, you know, of just, you know, kind of out there floating around. But I mean, I believe deep inside, deep in our souls, that we all have a sense um, of wanting to be free or having a sense of freedom in our lives. So it brings us to our scripture and what I want to talk about today. What does humanity, we as created people, by a righteous and a just God, what would we really need to be free from as a people of God? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because the text today in Romans 8, Paul has a lot to say about freedom for God's people. So if you have your Bible out and it's handy, turn to Romans 8. You can follow along with me. I'm going to read um, the first 11 verses, and we're going to refer to a couple other pieces of Scripture. So again, if your um, Bible is handy, you can follow along with me. So I'll read um, Romans 8, 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh, they cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. And since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, through the though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. It is the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead that dwells in you. And he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through the spirit that dwells in you. And this is the word of God. For the people of God on this day. If you would uh, bow with me in prayer. Almighty God thank you for your word. We thank you because it speaks truth. And because we can learn. And you teach us through your word. And we ask that this day Lord. Have us learn what it be you would want us to learn. Or teach us what you would like to teach us. Open our ears. Open our hearts. Open our minds Lord. And I ask that all that is said and all that is done is in glory and is honor to you. And that these words, Lord, are yours and they are not my own. Amen. Amen. So, you know, if we consider the first two verses that we read in Romans 8, uh, Paul is telling us that um, 
we can be free from, and it says clearly, we can be free from the law of sin and death. Okay. What's that even mean? What's it mean to be free from the law of sin and death? And then to say something like, well, to be free from death, whenever you say that, um, it always tends to raise eyebrows. Why? Well, because at some point we all die. We will all die. But see, Paul is not speaking at all about physical death, but the freedom um, from spiritual death. Not physical death, but freedom from spiritual death. Because you see, spiritual death, truly, is a sentence of death and judgment on the last day. You know, I'm reminded, when I think of that, I'm reminded of Hebrews 9. And, you know, Hebrews 9 says how we are appointed um, to die once. And then after that, the judgment. And again, referring to this physical death our body will experience. Um, but then this judgment um, is the sense of our eternity and of our spiritual life, um, if you will. Um, so let's break that down. There's a lot here. There's a lot of meat to this. We would never cover everything um, that's in those 11 verses. Um, but my goal today, today is to just give us something, some kind of takeaway that we can consider um, from what Paul is teaching here. Because overall, in these 11 or so verses that we read in uh, Romans 8, um, Paul is really focused on the calling of all believers to have a personal experience or relationship, if you will, to the Holy Spirit. This sense of life in the Spirit. To have that experience and relationship with God, the Spirit. To anchor our lives in the promised Holy Spirit, right? As Jesus said, he was leaving and the Spirit would come. The advocate, the counselor, the helper. As God, the Spirit would come to us um, to be with us. And overall, in these verses that we're reading, Paul is talking about this life in that Spirit, in that Spirit of God. So that through Christ and through the Holy Spirit, believers are empowered to live. And here we go with that word, liberated, or lives that are free. To live liberated lives through the power in this sense of the Spirit. You know, don't miss this either. Right in the very first verse, Paul said that, we would be free from condemnation. Well, what is that? That's free from this sentence of death, this condemnation. Or freed of judgment and freed of this sense of spiritual death um, through what Christ has done for us. But note this, I think it's important. None of this says that we are free from the struggle of sin. That that is something that's always present. And well, how do we know that? Well, uh, I just want to back up a little bit because Paul gives us a great uh, kind of a transition from that sense of, you know, that struggle of sin and then this sense of, you know, finding freedom um, in Christ. But if we backed up to the end here of chapter 7, just prior to chapter 8, we see Paul, he paints really, if you will, a graphic description or, um, let me, like, or he gives you this sense of the tension between the flesh, you know, humanity's, you know, actions and egos, if you will. So this sense of the tension between our flesh and the tension between that of the spirit, back and forth, if you will. And I just want to read a couple verses from that to give you um, an idea of how Paul sets this up in the chapter 8. But I'll read verse 14 in chapter 7. And Paul says, For we know that the law is spirit. But I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin, and I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And then he goes on in, in verse 18 and 19 to say, And I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. And in those verses, I point them out to say that is this sense of this um, struggle or tension between the flesh um, and the spirit of, you know, again, not being freed from the struggle of sin or being tempted by sin or trying to do, um, you know, what you feel is right in God's eyes and to be righteous. 
And you just, you know, you find that sometimes you fall short because it is this sense of the flesh um, against that. And then from that backdrop, uh, the end of chapter 7, talking about this battle or this struggle between flesh and the spirit, Paul goes right into verse 8 with the first verse that says, Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So after setting all that up at the end of 7, he now says, But there is deliverance. There is, for the word of the day, there is freedom in Christ. Freedom from the sense of condemnation and sin and judgment. Um, in my words, Paul says there's an antidote. There's a cure. Um, a remedy. Solution. Um, there's an answer to our condemnation. And I thought that's kind of an appropriate illustration when we think of an antidote or a cure or a remedy. Um, with the virus and all that's been going on with that, how we struggle now and we're looking for a way to, to find a, a vaccine or a cure or an antidote, if you will, um, for that horrible virus that's going around right now. And Paul's talking about this struggle between our flesh and the spirit and this battle that wages back and forth. But yet he says there is a cure. There is an antidote. And it's in the spirit. It's in life in the spirit. It's in Christ. And Paul exhorts us, or he encourages us, or he challenges us to live that life in the Spirit. And then he goes on in the rest of that, beginning of that chapter to say, because that will free us from sin and death through Christ, through the Spirit. See, what humanity, what we cannot do on our own, or what we are powerless to do in the flesh, God has done in the Spirit. Um, by sending His Son Jesus for the redemption of the world and for the redemption of each one of us of our sins. Um, he sent Christ to do that for us. Paul now puts out this sense of a, of, a, of a cure for our sin problem. You see, when you boil that down, that is the nucleus of the Gospel. I mean, is it not the good news? The good news is what? Jesus Christ came. God sent His only Son. Well, John 3.16. God sent His only sons that for those who believe in Him you know, may not perish, but have life everlasting. Um, I think about um, Galatians. I want to read a couple more. Um, Galatians, Paul again, in Galatians 4. Start in verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to, to what? To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adop adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. One more. Uh, 1 John. If we flip back near the back of our Bibles here, 1 John letter. Um, 1 John 4, verse 9. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Atoning meaning to be that replacement, to atone, to, to take care of. The words I've been using, this is, that is our remedy or our solution. So you see, in Paul's theology, he cautions us not to focus on lives that are centered by gratifying the flesh. Because as Paul says, it will lead to spiritual death. And he makes this point by emphasizing how a life lived to, gratis, to gratify the flesh, it cannot please God. And we read that in verse 8, in those first um, verses we read in, in chapter 8. In verse 8 it said that, I think, hostile to God. When we can't be pleasing to God, living that life centered on the flesh. But see, know this. It's important to understand also that the flesh, per se, is not evil or is negative. I mean, our bodies, fleshly bodies, are important. They're important for us to worship. They're important for us to fellowship. I mean, they're important for us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. They're important for us to show love to others, to extend a helping hand. I mean, reading scripture, calling out, you know, the, the, the um, hands and feet of God or of Christ. 
I mean, our bodies are important. So it's not the flesh per se that's just the negative part. See, even in the New Testament, Christ became flesh. John 1.14, though not sinful flesh, said, in, you know, when the word became flesh. I mean, the problem is not that people are flesh, that we are flesh. But see, a life dependent on human efforts, of human resources, I mean, of just living our own way or living all of our own will, or a life of, you know, a selfish lifestyle, as opposed to one that is directed by God's Spirit and living in the sense of God's Spirit to reflect and show that love of God. And we need our flesh and our bodies to do that. See, like many other God-given gifts, the flesh, it must cooperate with the power of the Holy Spirit to bring glory to God. That tension that Paul talked about between the flesh and the spirit, but they must cooperate. But you see, that conflict between the two that Paul does speak about, that characterizes the Christian life. I mean, is it not? Where many times we find that struggle or battle between to do what we know we want to do, but maybe we can't, or find that we can't. But see, Paul gives us that answer or that solution to the flesh and to the problem of the flesh is that it is the Holy Spirit. It is life in the Spirit. See, it, in that sense, it has liberating, if you will, or freeing power to be freed from condemnation, to find freedom from this, as Paul called the slavery to sin and death. Um, are, are you in search of this kind of freedom? I know I am many times. And the source is found in the power of God. And us staying connected to live that life in the Spirit, to fully live that life in the Spirit. Now, how do we do that? Because it can be hard. We know the struggle between the two or the conflict that Paul kind of paints. We do it by living prayer-filled lives. By staying connected to God through prayer, through his word, through our fellowship. See, without prayer and without this connection or without having that relationship with God, our relationship will be weak at best. Um, you see, in those times when we are not connected in that way or deeply connected in prayer and study and worship, almost certainly the flesh will dominate. And then that ultimately destroys um, or damages our relationship with God. We stay connected and we live that life in the Spirit through prayer coming directly from our hearts. From life studying and wanting to learn all we can of God and building our relationship and showing God's love. But most importantly, staying connected to experience this life in the spirit see by doing that we will and we can stay connected and we will and we can be free from many of the snares and many of the challenges that this world has for us amen I want to take some time now in our service uh, to uh, highlight and uh, celebrate our joys, uh, the blessings, but also our prayer concerns and those things that we need to lift um, to the Lord in prayer. And uh, feel free, as always, to email us any prayer request or call, however is best for you, and we'll be sure to uh, you know, raise them during this time. Um, also, send us uh, your joys and the blessings. We love to hear them, and we always like to highlight them here. And as always, our most recent prayer list was uh, sent out with the link uh, to this service and email. And look it over, uh, keep all those in prayer, and help us keep it up to date too. If there's someone that needs to be added or someone could be removed, just let us know about that. And uh, I want to lift as a jewel and as a blessing that I have um, for many weeks now during this time that we have been separated and not gathering together, and that is just your financial support, um, the continuation of how you've done that. It, it's just really, it's, it's been humbling, it's been a blessing um, uh, for those we serve um, and for the church and 
uh, just all that you do with that. I, I just wanted to recognize that and thank you for it. Uh, you should be um, very proud of um, the way you do that. And it's a blessing that, um, you know, God lays it upon our heart to continue to do those things because that allows us to extend that love um, to others. And if you are on our email prayer list, you may have seen recently out on our list, we um, asked for prayers for um, Victoria Hegman and uh, Sandy Backdorf. I want us to continue to remember uh, the Federici family um, with their accident. Uh, we had put that out in email last week, and there's much uh, to, to do with that. Uh, many things they have to work through, uh, still with healing, um, and then just um, all the other things that go with that. So let us remember them all uh, in prayer during this time. And Don Haven is continuing uh, with his immunotherapy. Uh, we're gonna pray for uh, results with that and that it works for him. So let us remember him and Erlen during this time. And I wanted to mention, um, I, I know we had on our prayer list quite some time ago, a name uh, by Walter Richmond was in a very serious uh, car accident. Uh, I think it was back in November and uh, we had been, or had him on our prayer list since then, but um, Walter had passed away. And I just want us to now just keep his family uh, in prayer during this time and all those you know, connections um, that he has. So uh, just let us remember them in a time of loss. And in general, everyone on our prayer list, uh, we'll just continue to pray for them and think about those. And everyone is separated from loved ones. I know some things are opening up, but many of these uh, nursing facilities and, and hospitals and places like that are still have some pretty strong restrictions. So for those that can't visit or be with loved ones, let us continue to pray for them. We are seeing the financial impact and the crisis that has come out of so many things being shut down for so long with uh, people losing jobs and unemployment and businesses, all of that. Families, just let us remember uh, the impact that this virus has had um, more than, than health, but um, just psychologically and financially and all those things that go with that. I want us to pray um, for us, our church, as we do plan to reopen next week, but also for all the other churches. I know that are slowly reopening, some that are already open. So let us remember that and let us pray for the safety um, of all those during that time. I want to lift all of those on our front lines, um, medical workers and the staff in the hospitals and the, the, the cleaning staffs and all, everything that makes um, hospitals and these care facilities, uh, nursing facilities work. Um, many people are in those and many times they um, are exposed or in a way of uh, working around people with the virus. So let us pray for them that they stay healthy. Um, our first responders, all of them out, uh, you know, working and all the hours of the night responding to various calls. I want us to remember those. And, you know, they're working hard on the vaccine for the virus. And I just want to pray that that comes sooner than later and uh, that God gives the wisdom for that and that uh, we can really find a way to really, um, you know, push this virus down to a level where, you know, we can gather without really the concern of um, how it can spread and, and really affect us. So let us pray for all working on that vaccine and that God um, gives them, uh, you know, the wisdom to work on that. And I want to, as always, so uh, we've talked about this uh, many times over the last few weeks, but to pray for peace. Um, yes, within our country, within our towns, within our communities, um, within the world. And just let us um, pray for the leaders, um, those that guide us, those that are uh, making decisions to, you know, to work through many things that are happening now. And I just ask for, during all of that, we feel a sense of God's love and God's peace um, in all of it. So if you would, bow with me in a time of prayer. Almighty God, we come this day with thanks. We just thank you for the many blessings of our lives and so many times uh, there are blessings that we may not even recognize. But Lord, let us thank you for them all. We thank you for the so many volunteers um, throughout the communities working to help feed those, to help care for others um, that are just there for those in need. Lord, we thank you um, for all of them. We thank you for um, a generous heart and a generous spirit that you have given to so many during this time and for the support um, not only here um, in Asbury that um, has been given, Lord, but um, in all places. And it's done because of the love of others. We ask that your spirit continues to lead and guide us in all of these things. And Lord, we mentioned many this day in need of prayer and healing and uh, comfort and touch of you. And we know many were not mentioned. 
So let us just take a moment and silently lift those to you now. Dear God, we know you've heard each one and we know you have each situation in your hand. You know it intimately and we just ask that you provide uh, whatever is needed in all of those things. We pray for all of those on our prayer list. We pray for all of those that we mentioned and all of those that we did not mention, Lord. We lift to you for you to provide whatever is needed in each situation. And Lord, in a time of loss, we pray for um, the Richmond family. And we just ask that you bring them that sense of peace which does pass all understanding. Lord, we pray for all that are sick and recovering, those that are alone and those that cannot see their loved ones. We pray for the financial well-being of many that are without jobs or without incomes and there are ways for us to provide, show us those ways and allow us to provide what we can. As we begin to reopen many things within our communities, uh, many businesses and uh, different places, but Lord, we pray specifically this day for, our, for Asbury and for our place of worship as we reopen next week. We pray for the safety of all of those uh, that come. We pray that you lead and guide us in all that we do to you know, have a reopening and a celebration at that time. Lord, we pray for our leaders as they make decisions. And we pray for a sense of peace in the difference of opinions, in the difference um, within all of us. But let us see the commonality in you, Lord, as you are our Savior to all. Let us see that common bond that is between us in you. We pray for all that are on the front lines, all that protect us, uh, those that are working all the hours of the night, Lord. We just ask for you to be with them and protect them. And of course, Lord, we thank you for our military who keep us safe. And they allow us to worship freely and the freedoms we do have here in this country. Lord, and many have given their lives for those freedoms and we thank you for them and we ask for your blessing upon their families. We ask for you to continue to be with those that are away from their home when they serve in foreign lands and dangerous places and be with their families as they are separated from one another. In all of this story, we just thank you for Jesus. And let us pray and let us lift our voice how Jesus taught us. And let us say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And at this time to close our service I'd like to turn it over to Paul Kranz who also has a very special song for us. And I'm going to let him introduce that um, for us this day. With that, Paul. All right, this uh, is entitled 12 Disciples, and it's written by Mike Cross. And years ago, I added a third verse to it. Uh, so. A man came to Galilee Walking beside the sea, he saw some fishermen with nets in their hand. He called to them that day, and what he heard them say was, Come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. There was Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, James and Levius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, twelve, twelve were called. He called them together, and he gave them the power to heal 
sickness and to cast evil out. He sent them as messengers to heal and to spread the word that all of the prophecies would soon come about. There was Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, James son of Zebedee and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, James and Levius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, twelve, twelve were called. He told them parables to show them God's will for man, the scope of God's forgiveness, and how things should be done. Stories like the prodigal son and the unforgiving debtor taught them unforgiveness so salvation could be won. Well, there was Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, James son of Zebedee and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, James and Levius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, and scared to die but he told them he had come so we might be saved he said all men are brothers and love one another and be not afraid for I am with you always there was Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew James son of Zebedee and his brother John Philip and Bartholomew Thomas and Matthew James Levius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, twelve, twelve were called, I said twelve, twelve were called. Paul, I want to thank you again for closing our service with that special song, um, naming our 12 disciples. And, you know, we can truly find and we can experience freedom in Christ. And freedom is found when we live, as Paul said, a life in the Spirit. And we are freed from condemnation. So let us go forth this day in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.